Thanks. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I hadn't been to University of Michigan before, so this is my, my first visit, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to uh, come here on, in, in such a, a wonderful, uh, warm welcome. So let me, uh, I'm going to start by, let's see, this is... bio, but especially when I'm talking to students, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the unofficial bio because students think we have this whole career planned out. You know, I always wanted to be a dean from the time I was born and, you know, just followed a straight and narrow path towards that. So I want to tell you a little bit about the really circuitous path that I took. I never thought I would be a dean, let alone an engineer. So uh, my, uh, my dad was a mechanical engineering professor at Berkeley. Uh, he was there for almost 50 years. And my mom was a cartoonist for the Bullwinkle and Rocky Show. In fact, she was a character designer, and you can see the resemblance between her and Natasha Patel. She was the model for Natasha Patel. So I had these. So um, I also like to tell students it's good to fail early and often. Uh, that's why, you know, being an entrepreneur is fine. I was the kid to save my parents' marriage. I failed at that, and they divorced when I was very young, so I grew up with my very creative mom. Uh, but I had this engineering side of my dad as well, and I really like to think of engineering as bringing together very creative out-of-box thinking like my mom and uh, the very mathematical, methodical, uh, mechanical engineering professor dad that I had. So I, um, I started out at Berkeley. I almost left engineering, as I think many women uh, can relate to. Uh, at that time, there were very few women. Nobody thought women should be in engineering. Uh, and I wasn't doing very well because I had actually dropped out of high school and taken my senior off to travel through Europe. So I wasn't prepared for for. for engineering study at Berkeley and I'm glad I didn't leave engineering because it's a wonderful profession but sadly I thought in the 80s okay well by the time my hypothetical daughter uh, if she wants to study engineering does study engineering it'll be better for her so my uh, my real daughter I'll come to her in a moment had actually unfortunately not such a different experience as I did so we still have a long way to go in making this profession uh, open and uh, welcoming to diverse people and why is that important? I mean, you alluded to the work I do in that. It's because it's about excellence. The profession needs diverse ideas and perspectives to thrive. And so we really need to bring in these diverse people uh, who bring so much to the profession. So uh, I went to Berkeley. I finished in 1986. I had no idea what I was going to do next. And so I took a job in Silicon Valley. So this, this is uh, right off Highway 101 in Great America Parkway. This was my first job in 1986. You see there's nothing behind it. Um, and it was a defense communication company because there was no cellular in 1986 when I graduated. The first cellular systems had just rolled out in 1986. So uh, I worked in defense communication because I love communication. I didn't like working in defense. Uh, but I was working with some really interesting PhDs, and I liked the way that they thought about problems. So I said, OK, I want to think about problems like they do. I'm going to go back uh, to school and get a master's. So I went back to school to get a master's. And my amazing advisor, Praveen Varai, took a chance on me. Okay, I was rejected from Stanford for grad school, by the way. So if you're rejected from a university, you may end up teaching there for a long time. <laughs> uh, but I, I was admitted to Berkeley by my advisor because he, he saw something about me. He took a chance on me. And I think that's another major lesson you know, to convey to all you young people is that taking a chance, whether it's in your own research or on hiring someone who may not have all the credentials, but there's something special about them, uh, can, can actually pay off. Now, I spent my summers at at and Bell Labs working with Jerry Faschini, who actually uh, was one of the very early thinkers about MIMO, Larry Greenstein, who was my mentor at Bell Labs, and Ronaldo Valenzuela. And that's where I really got grounded in wireless communication. I loved working at uh, Bell Labs. It was one at and Bell Labs. This was before they split up. And when I finished uh, uh, my PhD, I looked broadly. I looked at industry jobs, academic jobs. I looked at going back to Bell Labs. There was a lot of turmoil because AT&T and Bell Labs were splitting at the time. So I ended up getting a, a job at Caltech. And that's where I started my academic career and also started my marriage. Uh, and then I moved to Stanford in 1999. My husband's job was and still is and has always been in the Bay Area. So we've navigated these two body issues, uh, you know, cross country marriage now. Uh, I have an amazing husband. So we moved back to Stanford. We had jobs in the same place for 21 years. 
Uh, I took the job as dean at Princeton, started in the fall of 2020 in the middle of COVID. It helps to be an optimist, especially when you're taking on leadership roles. So, you know, people said to me, are you sorry you took the dean job? And I said, well, you know, uh, actually all the reasons I came to Princeton, which was to really bring up engineering and make uh, an engineering school thrive within a great liberal arts university and focus on Princeton's informal motto for engineering, which is uh, Princeton's motto is to benefit the nation and all humanity, and that's why I became an engineer, and how to do that in an engineering school within a liberal arts university. All of those things were still true in the middle of COVID, and so I just took advantage of nobody's traveling, I can do strategic planning, I'm not traveling, I don't need to go talk to donors, and, and I can just focus on uh, what is the collective vision for the School of Engineering and put that together into a strategic vision. I did found two wireless companies, uh, Quantena, which, oops, that was too soon. Quantana uh, went, that wasn't Quantana. <laughs> um, so uh, I founded Quantana in, uh, actually in, in 2006. It went public in 2016. And I did it not to make money because uh, if most startups go under. So if you start a company to make money, you're unlikely to be successful. If you start a company, especially as an academic, to see if the research that you do actually matters in practice, which is why I founded Quantena, um, you might be very rewarded. And in fact, the 20 years of research that I'd done at Stanford, uh, leading to, and, and at Caltech and in my graduate work, um, made the best Wi-Fi chip company in the world, which was Quantena. We had the best technology for a decade. Um, and that was really exciting to actually see theory matter in practice. And then Plume Wi-Fi, I started a few years later, to do software in the cloud to manage um, wireless. First, we were going to uh, manage small cell base stations, and then we did wireless access points. And that was because at that time, 2010, the notion of software in the cloud to do anything was very new. And I thought, you know, if we could actually put software in the cloud to manage wireless networks, uh, distributed wireless networks, uh, that could really be a game changer for the field. So that's why I started both of those companies. Lots of ups and downs, really exciting and challenging and terrifying and awful, you know, to do a startup. So I always say academics have great jobs. So, you know, if you think, you know, doing a startup is all roses and champagne and then a lot of money at the end, typically not. It's a lot of fun, but it's also crazy, uh, a crazy experience. Um, I serve on three corporate boards, which is also a lot of fun. I could talk about that over uh, at the reception. I do a lot of work around diversity in STEM. Uh, as mentioned, I think that the profession can't thrive without uh, having diverse people in it. And unfortunately, we have not made as much progress as I had hoped when I was your age, you know, the young people. Um, and at some point about a decade ago, when I realized women don't win awards, uh, they're not recognized for their work, people of color, people that are diverse, um, uh, are not welcome in the community and not recognized, and therefore we're losing them. Half of the women that enter the tech workforce leave. Uh, the profession can't thrive. And if someone like me, who's established and senior, isn't going to spend time on this, then things aren't going to get better. And that's why I ended up devoting a lot of my time to diversity in STEM, and the IEEE has made a huge amount of progress in that dimension. My best results are uh, my kids, Daniel and Nicole. As I mentioned, Nicole, she got her bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering at Stanford, and uh, she had, uh, I remember it was very kind of heartbreaking when she came home freshman year and said, Mom, now I know why you spend so much time on diversity and inclusion, because people don't think I belong here. And uh, so we still have a lot of ways to go. My son is also an electrical engineer, so, um, so my kids, you know, I keep saying my husband's who's my co-author on these uh, best results here. Uh, he's also an electrical engineer. And, and I like to tell him, what did we do wrong? We produced two engineers. It's, you know, no diversity in our family. But anyway, um, OK, so let me, let me go on to talking about future wireless networks. I've been working in wireless for since the 80s. And I think this is one of the most exciting times in the whole time I've been working in the field for future wireless networks. Because um, up until now, uh, most communication has been first about people talking to each other, first over analog phones, and then digital phones that you could move around with. I mean, most of you don't remember, we used to have to plug these things into the wall. I mean, we couldn't take a phone with us, to, and, and we could only talk on it. You know, there were no apps or anything like that. So we've come a long ways when it comes to telecommunication. And that was kind of the driver for the first generation of, of, of wireless. But 
then you know we could access information over the internet. And now, if you think about how we can connect anything with an on-off switch together, and the applications that that might enable from in-body communications, Medtronic is building unbelievable, that's one of the companies I'm on the board of, unbelievable biomedical devices from deep brain stimulation that can cure incontinence, the effects of Parkinson, trembling. You turn on this deep brain stimulator and the trembles stop. You know, I mean, it's just uh, robotics that can take someone who hasn't been able to walk and you put this exoskeleton on them and they can walk. I mean, it's just, uh, I'm so enthralled with the technology that all of us can develop. And wireless plays a big role. Automation, automated highways, deep sensing, deep learning. So there's really exciting things going on in wireless. And now with the Chips and Science Act, there's a lot more investment in it, which is exciting. One of the big challenges is the fact that um, we don't have a lot of useful spectrum. So if you look at the licensed airwaves, which are below millimeter wave, millimeter wave is, is lightly licensed. So if you look in the, in the, um, you know, the five gig band and below, uh, most of the spectrum is occupied. And we're in spectrum deficit if you look at the growth in wireless communication. So if, if you look at this chart and you say, okay, by 2025, we're almost, you know, uh, 100 gigahertz in deficit for the spectrum that we need for wireless communication, how come we're still able to use our cell phones? Well, it's because primarily because of Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi is not licensed, okay? It's unlicensed spectrum. And there's a lot of spectrum in the Wi-Fi band. So in the 5 gig band, there's 100 megahertz of spectrum. Whereas in the licensed bands, there's only about 20, 30, 40 megahertz of spectrum. So the reason that we're still able to use our devices is because of the open bands, the unlicensed bands of Wi-Fi. There is a millimeter wave in terahertz, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but these, these frequencies, even though there's tens of gigahertz of spectrum, the laws of physics apply, and the laws of physics make it very hard to communicate at those frequencies. Now, one of the recent, uh, relatively recent things that I did uh, before leaving Stanford was to look at molecular communication. So this is saying, why don't we send bits, ones and zeros, using chemicals? And you might say, well, why would we do that when we have such sophisticated wireless communication? Well, you know, if you think about in-body communication, those wireless electromagnetic signals may cause some damage. If you think about communicating under the ocean or through oil pipes, um, molecular communication might work better because the propagation medium is more amenable to sending uh, communication over chemicals. So we got on the order of bits per second with molecular communication, which isn't, you know, very fast, but it's enough to turn on or off a drug delivery machine or, or certain types of devices. So that, that was pretty fun. Um, so we don't have good ways to use more spectrum uh, other than Wi-Fi, which is also starting to fill up. And we see that this Internet of Things, where anything with an on-off switch uh, can communicate, is growing tremendously. So how are we going to support all of the devices that are associated with the Internet of Things when we're kind of out of spectrum? And that's one of the things that's really interesting to me about challenges in wireless communication. How do we take all of these different types of applications, which have different requirements, in very limited spectrum and make them work reliably. And it's one thing if your phone doesn't work well and you're watching cat videos. It's another thing if you're using this for self-driving cars or remote surgery. You don't really tolerate unreliable communication, yet wireless communication is by nature unreliable. So how do we build this next generation of systems that's going to solve the spectrum shortage be reliable and support such a broad range of different applications. So that's the thing is, is smartphones and all of the drivers for wireless and Wi-Fi and cellular have always been about just getting to higher data rates. That's all we've been focused on. How do we, you know, double the data rate or increase it by an order of magnitude? We haven't really focused on low energy consumption. So if you think about something that's going inside the body, or that you're embedding a sensor in a bridge to measure the stress and strain and it's got to last on batteries for the lifetime of the bridge. You need very low um, energy consumption, which is very different from how we've built systems with smartphones where you can recharge the phone. If you think about low latency, you know, automated driving, 
remote surgery. You need, you have a very stringent constraint on the latency, and if you drop packets and that increases latency, your whole system may fall apart. And then the other thing we haven't really focused on much in wireless is notions of security and privacy and resilience. I'll talk about those uh, towards the end. So the promise of 5G about, uh, so 5G was released, I mean, it's still iterating this decade, but it was released in 2020. And the promise was that these networks, these 5G networks, would do everything simultaneously. We'd be able to get hundreds of megabits per second, so very high data rates, um, even peaks of 10 gigabits per second. Now, again, if you think about 20 megahertz of spectrum, uh, which is what the license band has, getting up to 10 gigabits per second means you're, you have to do something different than just send, uh, send data the way we usually send data. That's a very high number of bits per second for hertz to fit into that spectrum. Um, we also want to be able to get 10 years on batteries. So that's for those sensors or the Internet of Things that are embedded in devices that you can't recharge. And then we want instant <coughs> ultra reliability for these kinds of applications where if you drop a packet, it can be catastrophic. And we want to do all of this with one network. So that was the promise of 5G. This is from Nokia. Uh, there were many similar diagrams at the time. And so how do we do all this simultaneously with one network? Well, the, the dirty secret of cellular uh, communication and next G is that um, the promises that we make for the next generation of wireless are made to be, like, like Jonathan Swift said, promises and pie crusts are made to be broken. And that's especially true in wireless standards because it drives the next generation. So I mean, if you think about what people are talking about, oh, now we've got to start working on 6G because we've deployed 5G. But 5G didn't deliver the promise that it said it was going to deliver. Yeah, that's why we need 6G. So you have to give us more money to do research in 6G, and you have to go out and buy a new cell phone that has 6G because we're really going to deliver all of this in 6G. So when I talk about disrupting next G, next G or you know, 5G, 6G, 10G, those are marketing terms, okay? When, when your cell phone provider says, oh, we have a 6G phone, it's probably really a 5G phone with maybe a few bells and whistles on it. But there is a need to evolve the technology. So the needs of the applications that I described are not going to be satisfied with current wireless. So what is it that we need to do for the next wave of wireless to be able to enable all these exciting applications? So we need uh, enabling technologies across the board. Uh, so I like to have interactive talks. So I'm going to ask a question. Rethinking cellular system design. Um, so the original concept of a cellular system is this picture here, where you've got base stations in the middle of all the cells. There were no multiple antennas when this was invented. Uh, and then you have mobiles moving around, and, and the mobiles talk to the base station, and then you hand them off as the mobiles are moving. So that concept was invented in a particular decade. And I'm going to ask for a show of hands which decade it was invented in. OK, so I told you the first analog phones were rolled out in the 80s. So it wasn't the 80s. It had to be before the 80s. How many people think it was the 70s? Okay, nobody. 60s? 50s? Maybe 40s? Forties? It was the 40s. Okay, so it was 1948. It was the same year that Shannon's paper came out in a paper by D.H. Ring, Bell System Technical Journal. And he had a picture exactly like this, except it was all analog and there were no multiple antennas. Okay, so we haven't rethought the way we design cellular systems since that picture that D.H. ran in his paper that came out in the 1940s. We certainly advanced the physical layer techniques and we've advanced uh, multiple access and, and, and many other aspects of the electronics, but the concept hasn't changed. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, and we've evolved in things like, OK, we can have the base stations talk to each other. We can have small cells and big cells. We can have distributed antennas. We can have multi-hop routing. All of that's been introduced in various standards in cellular and in Wi-Fi. But we haven't really rethought the concept that, in fact, we don't need to break the geographic region into these geographic cells. We can treat it as one big network where there's different antennas. They're all distributed antennas. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, later on, we need to use the millimeter wave and maybe even the terahertz spectrum. That was pushed very hard for 5G. 
So millimeter wave is part of the standard. Um, it really hasn't panned out yet. Uh, and part of it is the laws of physics. I'll talk about that. The question is whether we really will be able to use these high frequencies to do anything other than kind of niche applications where you're very close to the transmitter. Uh, massive MIMO is definitely a huge enabler and has been a huge enabler almost since it was invented. So I'll talk more about what is massive MIMO, what are the challenges that we see going forward in that. And then another interesting thing that there's been less work on, and this was actually the basis for uh, the second company I founded, Clean Wi-Fi, is putting software in the cloud to do optimization of large cells and small cells. So I'm going to talk about that as well. Uh, and then I mentioned security, privacy, and resilience, and machine learning. Okay, so I've gone through 10 minutes of my talk without mentioning machine learning. So where does machine learning come in all this? Uh, can't it solve everything? I mean, why are we even listening to this talk? We'll just throw everything at some large language model. It will spit out the design that will do everything we need for wireless communication, and we can go sit on a beach. And people said that. I mean, 10 years ago, it was like, machine learning was going to solve everything. OK, well, can't it enable everything? It's certainly a bandwagon today. And the question is, should we jump onto the bandwagon and say we should use machine learning for all of the things that were on the previous slide? Uh, or should we run away screaming? Uh, and you know, I tend to not be a bandwagon type researcher. If everybody is working on something, I run away screaming. But machine learning was intriguing. And it was actually the work I was doing on molecular communication that got me interested in using machine learning in traditional communication. And the reason is molecular communication doesn't follow Maxwell's equations. It follows a diffusion model, because you're diffusing chemicals through the medium. So no Maxwell's equations, no channel model. So you can't create a mathematical model for the channel as you can with Maxwell's equations and electromagnetic propagation. So my postdoc, Nariman Farsad, he was working on this chemical communication. And he said, can't equalize the channel. The chemicals stick around in the channel for a long time, so it's a real problem to equalize it, especially if you're using an acid for a 1 and a base for a 0. So as soon as you send a 1, 0 pair, the chemicals cancel each other out. So how do we equalize it? So we applied machine learning, because we didn't have a model, and it worked really well. So that's what got us interested in using machine learning. And we demonstrated, in fact, that machine learning could beat theory in physical layer design, particularly in equalizers, and also in joint source channel encoding and decoding. I'll talk about the equalizers in a moment. Um, but that also uh, pointed to the broader issue that machine learning may actually provide approximate solutions to these network resource allocation problems we've been trying to solve for decades. So I worked in the 90s on uh, channel allocation for 2G cellular networks, which is a graph coloring problem. It's an NPR problem. We can solve it. But, you know, maybe then we apply some new technique like machine learning. And certainly carriers are looking at that. Uh, machine learning may provide breakthroughs in security and detecting anomalies or being able to figure out how to be resilient. And also in cross-layer design, which is another area of wireless and, and backbone wireline networking that we've never been able to solve well. So you can see from uh, this rather optimistic view of machine learning that I've kind of jumped on the bandwagon, at least with you know one foot or one arm. And in fact, more than that, you know, we have a book that uh, talking about machine learning and wireless <coughs> communication, which is looking both at the physical. It's an edited book. Um, it's looking at physical layer techniques as well as the use of machine learning uh, in wireless communication. And the flip side of that coin which is using wireless networking to do distributed machine learning. And I'll touch on some of that in, in some of the later slides. OK, so there are new things to do at the physical layer, from new waveforms to coding to detection, multiple antenna techniques, access, and then using this new tool. But you might ask, especially people as old as me or older, uh, we've heard this before. You know, Isn't the physical layer dead? Why are we still working on the physical layer? So the physical layer <laughs> modulation, coding, multiple access has been declared dead many times. All right, so starting in 1971 at the uh, information theory workshop, the coding is dead workshop, as they called it, uh, it was declared dead. Uh, and it was actually Erwin Jacobs in the back of the room who held up an 8-bit integrated circuit and said, this is going to revolutionize coding. And it did. And so coding wasn't dead in 1971. Then in the 1980s, 
before cellular came out, there was a sense that, you know, we've done everything there is to do in communications. All the people at Bell Labs in the group that I ended up working for that summer, they were moved from wireless to optical fiber networks because there was nothing to do in wireless. And then cellular came out and that took off. And then I would say in the 2000s, you know, with the dot-com bust and all of that, there wasn't a lot of work. And then, you know, the iPhone came out and all of the networks were brought to their knees. And so we need to create a new set of networks. And, you know, and also uh, with 4G uh, came out and then it was like, okay, this is mature. We don't need to do anything. Then Huawei came in and built all this great communication uh, equipment. And now we're back with chips and science doing more work in communication. So I just want to talk about a few techniques here that I think are interesting on uh, the physical layer innovation. If you look at the different generations of, of wireless networks and what have we used for the physical layer access. So second generation was TDMA, except in Europe was GSM, 3G was CDMA, 4 and 5G is ODM. So what about this next generation, whether it's 6G or 7G? Is there room for a new modulation? Um, so if you look at uh, these three different techniques, so TDMA is taking uh, your time frequency power dimensions and slicing them along the time domain, frequency domain, OFDM is doing that along the frequency domain, and code CDMA uh, uses codes to spread across both time and frequency. And OFDM is actually close to Shannon capacity achieving if you can measure the channel and feed that information back. And that was actually a lot of the work I did in my, um, in my PhD was what's the capacity of a time varying channel? Well, if you can measure the channel and feed it back to the transmitter, then you adapt your data rate and your power to, so that when the channel's good, you send more data. When the channel's bad, you send less data. So it's intuitive, but it requires that you know the channel. Okay? And it's not so easy to measure a channel and feed it back in real time to adapt to it, especially as we go to these higher frequencies like millimeter wave and terahertz. So maybe there's room for a new way of thinking about modulation for these new systems where you may not have time to feed it back, you may not have a feedback link, um, you may not have the complexity in either the transmitter or the receiver to do that. And so I actually uh, was working with a group that founded a company called Cohere on a completely new modulation technique. Uh, doing modulation in the de delay Doppler domain instead of the time frequency domain. And when I first was introduced to the company, um, they wanted me to evaluate it. I think I was one of the VCs of my startup said, would you go evaluate this company? I said, there's no way they have something interesting. You know, we, we, we're done with the physical layer. There's nothing more th to do. And so I went and I talked to them and I was actually very intrigued. And so what they're doing is saying, if we modulate in the delay Doppler domain, it's actually very stable. It doesn't change nearly as fast as the time frequency domain. So the time frequency domain is changing at the rate of the Doppler, whereas the Doppler doesn't change very fast. Okay, whatever the Doppler is, it's based on the direction that you're going and the velocity. So it, it doesn't change very fast, it's fairly stable. And you can see that here, that if you put like one bit modulated in the delay Doppler domain, it ends up getting spread out. You see a lot of variation in the time frequency domain. And it turns out that you can go between the time frequency domain and the delay Doppler domain using this math transform called the ZAC transform, which uh, Ronnie Hidani, who's a math professor at UT Austin, did a lot of theoretical work in the ZAC domain and then came to realize, hey, this is something we could actually use in practice because it makes the system very stable. So this means that you don't need to estimate things very quickly because it's not the channel in this domain is not changing uh, very fast. So you get the full diversity over the time frequency domain by putting one modulation bit in a block of time of, of delay and Doppler. So what does this actually do in practice? This modulation is called orthogonal time frequency space division, OTFS. And you see that when you can't adapt, so you just send at a fixed rate, that with both short and long packets and at different velocities, you get basically, if you look at the top curve here that's um, the purple one, you get an error rate of infinite because you just, the, the, the channel is changing so fast 
that uh, you're going to end up in a frequency null, and you get bursts of errors there. Whereas the OTFS, you get significant gains even at fairly low Dopplers and certainly at, at the very high Doppler rate. So I thought this was really intriguing just as a way to um, think differently and say, okay, there is new things that you can do at the physical layer if you think about the problem differently. If you model it and say, okay, this is, uh, I'm not going to think about communication system in time frequency, even though that's how we've been thinking about it since we started doing Fourier transforms. I'm going to look in a different domain, and all of a sudden looking in a different domain leads to some really significant performance benefits. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, machine learning. And so, um, so why do we need machine learning? I mean, this block diagram is, has been the same for all time. You know, if you open any communication book, you'll see a, a block diagram that looks like this. And, and so if you look at that diagram, you say, well, where would machine learning come in? So, so normally, we design a transmitter and receiver based on a model for the channel H of F. Well, what if we don't know H of F? That was the case in that molecular communication problem that I described. What if you know uh, H of F, but you don't know its parameters? So if you think about you're modeling a channel as a tap delay line, but you don't know the weights on the taps. Um, or what if you know H of F per perfectly, but the theoretically optimal thing to do, which is perturbing decoding, is too complex. The complexity is too high. And so I can't, with the computational constraints that I have, I can't apply perturbing decoding. Um, so how does thinking about machine learning solve this problem? Well, you don't need to know H of F to do machine learning. You learn from the data. Um, and this, it turns out that the ML solution is robust to estimation error because it's not trying to invert the channel. That's what equalization is doing generally, is it's trying to invert the channel. You're not trying to invert the channel with machine learning. So if you don't know the channel perfectly, it's OK. Whereas with equalization, if you're inverting the channel and you get it wrong, things blow up. So we looked at um, uh, solving this. We did some work, and I don't have time to talk about our end work. So we started by saying, OK, the channel's a black box. And we'll just do training from the data to the recovered data, and, and that's our machine learning technique. But that is way too computationally complex. To, to the amount of time that you need to train a black box machine learning algorithm to do data detection is not practical. So then we said, well, OK, we can use our knowledge of what's theoretically optimal, which is perturbing decoding, and just learn what we don't know, which is the channel parameters, probability of y given x. So we ended up using a machine learning based tool to learn that probability of y given x. So the only place that we're applying the machine learning is within the Viterbi decoder. The structure of the decoder is classic Viterbi, but we're learning the parameters. And it turns out that that gave us almost as good performance as Viterbi with perfect channel state information. Of course, we can't beat Viterbi with perfect information because it's theoretically optimal. So the maturity with perfect information is this uh, blue curve. The red curve is this Viterbi, uh, machine learning applied to a Viterbi structure, but you use the machine learning to learn the channel. So you can learn the channel very well and then apply what's theoretically optimal. If Viterbi doesn't know the channel, you get this kind of error performance. Because again, Viterbi decoding is trying to invert the channel. So if you don't know the channel well, you get very high error rates, whereas this the Turby net is much more robust to estimation error. Uh, because again, it's not trying to learn the, the channel itself. So this is what we found. And again, this is just a, a one piece of a lot of work that we did on applying machine learning to doing equalization, is that you can get um, much faster training and lower complexity than an end-to-end -end machine learning based technique. But we also showed in other work that this machine learning could be beat Viterbi if you had a computational complexity on your decoder, because Viterbi is exponentially complex in the, in the data rate and, um, and the number of multiple antenna parameters and so forth. OK, so, so what this led to was thinking about neural networks in a different way. So this is that classical communication system I said before. Can we, as communication theorists, think about ML as a communication system? And, we haven't done any work on this, but I think it's really interesting to 
think about maybe some of the theory of machine learning, if we think about it as a communication problem, we might be able to understand machine learning better. So the idea is that, so what is machine learning doing? You have input data and then the output is classification or some kind of a decision. Um, the training is really compression, right? So when you look at this is, this is the neural network, picture of the neural network, um, the neural network is taking all of the training data and reducing it down to the weights and the biases in the machine learning algorithm. So if you take you know, millions of training data, what this training of the neural network is doing is compression. It's taking that millions of input data and reducing it down to W and B. So is there anything we know about classical compression or theoretical limits of compression that could tell us more about how long we need to train? how close we're getting to the theoretically optimal W and bias. I don't know the answer, but it's an interesting way to pose the question. And then the top, once you've done that uh, identification of the parameters, this is also just a communication system. So again, are there, is there theory of communications that we could apply to understand machine learning better? So that's an open question that I'll pose. Let me move to massive MIMO. So here, the idea of massive MIMO is that if you have hundreds of antennas, you can point a beam directly at uh, your receiver. And that removes everything that we've been worried about in communications for the last three, four decades. Okay, so we worry about fading, you know, the, the, these reflections come in shifted in phase and time and they cancel each other out. And that's why if I'm standing here, I may have a really good signal. And if I move to here, I have a bad signal. Um, this removes that because there are no reflections, pointing the beam directly where I want to go. It removes attenuation because the, where the 1 over f squared power fall off with distance comes from is omnidirectional antennas where the energy is propagating in all directions. So if I'm pointing the antenna, the more finely I point the antenna, the dependence on the frequency goes down. So the problem with millimeter wave is that it's at a very high frequency, so I can't transmit very far. But you get around that through this massive MIMO. It also removes interference because I'm pointing directly where I want to go so I don't interfere with anybody else. So again, we can just go home. We can stop working on communication theory because we've solved all the problems. Except, so that's true in theory but not in practice because in practice you'll get some kind of a building or a person or a car that gets in the way that scatters all the beams and then you can't close the link. And this is why 5G millimeter wave is a bust. Okay, so it really has not worked well in practice. And it's not clear we can solve the millimeter wave challenge. Because it's not, you know, we can build more antennas, we can build bigger antennas, we can make them cheaper and lower energy as we advance the electronics. But we can't get around the physical challenges within, uh, within the, the channel itself. Now maybe we could use multi-hopper mesh networks, but um, that's also been a challenge. Uh, the best mesh networks we have right now are the ones you use in your home, uh, and, and those are a couple of hops at most. So if you really want to do very many hops, you lose half the data rate on every hop, and so the performance is pretty bad. Okay, um, I'm going to skip this. Uh, so let me get to the rethinking cellular system design. So I already told you, you know, the original notion of cellular systems, invented by D.H. Ring, the idea is that these systems are interference limited. So you want to reuse frequencies in a way that there's just enough interference and no more so that you can close your link. And the capacity of a cellular system is unknown unless you assume that all the base stations are connected together with zero latency and then it just becomes one big uplink or downlink. So it's one distributed base station that's talking to all of the mobiles. Um, and, and that is not the way we design cellular systems, so it's not a good bound on what the capacity would look like. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's been advances in thinking about cellular systems to say, let's let the base stations talk to each other. That was part of the WiMAX protocol in 3G. Uh, small cells have advanced. We, we see small cells rolling out. Relays were also part of the 3G uh, standard, never really happened. And same with distributed antennas. So, the only advance from the DH ring paper is we went from analog to digital and we put multiple antennas on the base stations and on the, um, and on the mobiles and we have small cells. Okay, so is it still true that these systems are interference limited? 
We have many ways to reduce interference. We can use signal processing to do multi-user detection. We can use multiple antennas to point the beam so we get rid of interference. We can have the base stations talk to each other, in which case, what is interference? So if I think about these three cells uh, where the base stations are talking to each other, none of the mobiles in any of those three cells are interfering with each other because their base stations are talking to each other. So what is interference? Uh, what is a cell? All of these questions really haven't been asked. So in other words, we haven't really moved away from DH Ring's notion of what a cellular system should be like. And there's room to think differently in the same way as I talked about that OTFS modulation, just thinking about things in a different way. Same is true for these cellular systems. And then the other interesting thing as we look to the applications is, um, do we only care about capacity? Remember, I said that the advances in cellular have really been about getting to higher data rates. What about coverage? So um, in, in Menlo Park, where my house uh, uh, near Stanford was, every time we drive onto 280, the call gets dropped. Okay, this is the most expensive real estate in the world, and you still can't make a darn phone call, you know, because your call gets dropped. We're not focused on coverage, right? And so maybe we should be more focused on coverage, especially as we look to automated highways and other kinds of applications where we need coverage, or energy uh, efficiency. So there's a lot more to do in thinking about cellular system design. I want to talk a little bit about small cells. Uh, so in theory, small cells provide exponential capacity gain. And the reason for that, it's intuitive, is basically, so you take, you take a cellular system where each cell is a mile radius. And suppose you design the system so within that mile radius cell, you can support 100 users. Okay? Now you scale everything down. Scale the power down so that now the cell is a tenth of a mile radius. If everything scales, which uh, to an approximation it does, you can now fit that 100 users into a tenth of a mile cell radius. So as you shrink the size of the cell, if you design the system properly and everything scales, the power scales down, the propagation doesn't change, you can fit the same number of users in a smaller and smaller cell, which means overall you can support more users, exponentially more users. Um, but you can't roll out a system of small cells only because it takes too long and it's too expensive because you have to find places to put them. So most cellular systems are hierarchical. You have large cells that you roll out so that you, can, you can't sell a 6G phone unless you have 6G coverage around the nation. So you put up these big cells with a mile radius that have 6G coverage. You go out and start putting ads on TV that you can buy a 6G phone. And then when more and more people buy 6G phones, you start filling in with the small cells so that you don't you know, have those users have their call drop. So how do we, um, how do we optimize these kinds of networks? Uh, well, I mentioned before that the graph coloring problem, frequency allocation, and second generation cellular is an NP hard problem. Now we have all these other parameters we need to optimize. MIMO, power control, large and small cells. I call this, this is NP really hard. It's not just hard, it's really hard. <laughs> but fortunately, we have all these advanced optimization tools uh, that can optimize over millions of parameters. Um, and so we but we haven't really made a lot of progress in network resource allocation and optimization. And again, maybe this is a place where machine learning can play a role. But one of the things, and this also came out of my second startup, that, that we start thinking about is the problem is that doing everything in the cloud, it's complex to optimize everything. Plus, there's latency of getting the data up to the cloud and back. So what if we did things in the fog? We just look at the base stations that are close to each other because the ones that are far away aren't really interfering that much. And so this is this fog optimization, depending on the size of the fog, if you make it really small, it just becomes distributed optimization. If you make it really large, it becomes cloud optimization. You're optimizing everything. So you can kind of scale uh, how complex the optimization is, what the latency is by scaling up how many base stations are cooperating in this optimization. And of course, you'll lose some performance in theory going from fully distributed to fully centralized, but how much do you really lose? So we did some work on that uh, at, to look at fog optimization versus centralized. So this is 10 base stations, and this is 20, uh, either doing just single user decoding, which is less sophisticated, 
or joint decoding in all of the cells that are cooperating. And what we found is that for joint decoding, which is the harder technique, there's more to gain by going to fully centralized because you're doing joint decoding, but there's also like a knee in the curve where if you're doing four or five cells that are cooperating, that gets you fairly close to the fully centralized case. And in the, in the less sophisticated case, we lost about 50%, which is again a lot from the perspective of the um, end users. So, so this kind of leads to this notion of cloud-enabled wireless networking. What should we be putting in the cloud for all of these different types of networks? And, and how do we think about not just the wireless optimization, but also the cloud and the backbone together? So this is really important for the applications of this next generation of networks. So um, as we have automated highways, uh, telemedicine, uh, doing things with our phone that we can't even imagine, the Internet of Things, we can't just think about the wireless because so much of the information is going to go back to the cloud and be processed in the cloud. So how do we distribute between the edge and the cloud? Where should the optimization sit? Again, I think there's a lot of interesting questions here. Um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is collaboration over wireless networks. So this is, again, saying now we have all these distributed systems, and they're operating over these wireless networks. And we have to worry about things we didn't worry about before. So link failures, we've always worried about, you know, probability of error on a wireless network. But now we could have the whole grid fail. That's what happened in Texas, right? You know, we could have people that are listening in or malicious agents that are trying to make our system do something different. If you think about automated driving, if some malicious actor took over Waze, they could send everybody into the ocean, right? Because we're all just following ways blindly. We don't know where we're going anymore. We just follow what's on our phone. And you know, so you have to worry about these malicious actors coming in and changing things. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about a few things that we're doing in this area. So one is, how do we do centralized detection? So we're trying to detect an event has happened. It's an explosion, or a fire, or a terrorist attack. Um, when not all the sensors are connected. So you want them to cooperate with each other, but some of them may not be connected to the central station. So we use this clustering algorithm where, again, it's this notion of fog uh, collaboration. So you form groups of these different agents. They communicate with each other, and then with high probability, one of the nodes in these circles will actually uh, connect up to the fusion center. And you can... Um, we did a similar idea with federated learning. So we said, OK, what if we want uh, to now learn something across all of these different devices, but they're not all connected to the centralized um, uh, cloud that's doing the computation? And, and so looking, it's kind of this combination of how do we make sure that we can converge? What's the right algorithm for these different um, devices to cooperate with each other? taking into account the fact that the link is bad. And the last, uh, we can also introduce privacy in here as well, because when these nodes are talking to each other, they may not want to share, fully share their information. And the last uh, topic uh, that I'll just briefly touch on, because it's one of my favorite, is this notion of trust and resilience. So if you've got uh, a team of robots, and you want them to perform a particular task, but one may be malicious, okay? So how do you identify the malicious robot that's trying to make you go in the wrong direction or crash the whole team of robots. So it turns out that you can use the physical location of the robot, because that's something that's hard to spoof, to try to identify which is the malicious robot. And what we found is that you can converge on getting rid of or not taking into account the data from these malicious robots so that the true consensus value converges to the right value, even if you have half of the agents in your system be malicious. And again, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm happy to talk over uh, during the reception for more details on this. I just want to end with a few happy thoughts. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting research problems for all of you students out there in this next generation of, uh, of wireless technology. It's a new era for US technology innovation. You know, for those of us that have been working in this space for decades, the Chips and Science Act 
is tremendous. And it was mentioned that I'm on Biden's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. I was actually on the working group that made recommendations to how to sit, spend the money, the $30 billion of money for semiconductors. And I was invited to the signing of the Chips and Science Act. So that was a really exciting day. It is the best time to be working in this space. There's huge investment and there's a huge recognition that we are behind and that if we want to maintain innovation and national security in this space, we need to solve a lot of the problems that I've talked about. Uh, the killer app for uh, 6G is connecting the people that are unconnected. I think that we saw with COVID um, how difficult it is, even in this country, let alone in other countries, if you don't have connectivity, it's very difficult to thrive. And so let me just end uh, by saying, very exciting time for wireless technology. Um, future networks have to support all of these different constraints, and we don't know how to do that. So there's a lot of interesting problems out there, not just in designing the network, but the applications uh, to do distributed learning, distributed optimization, and make sure that that is secure and private and resilient. So uh, I hope many of you will be inspired to, to work in this area. There's lots of interesting problems. And hopefully, collectively, we can work to get the next billion connected. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much.